Hi, everyone. Um, we uh, are going to be uh, transitioning into a QA and a session right now. I'll be your um, host and moderator. Um, I, my name is Denise Hastoran. Um, I'm an engineer here in the remote uh, Meta Remote Presence Foundation signaling team, and I primarily focus on um, reliability of the uh, control plane uh, that we have for the uh, remote presence calls. Um, I would like to first thank all our speakers for these wonderful talks, uh, everything from the future of RTC to uh, going into the various challenges in operating these large-scale uh, real-time products. Um, we will be starting with uh, some questions here, and then please, uh, we encourage everyone to uh, raise your questions, and then we will try to get to as many as possible. Um, and thank you for um, submitting some questions already. Um, all right, so let's get started. I'm going to start with Sandhya. Sandhya, uh, thank you for that wonderful, informative talk. Um, our first question to you is, uh, software and AI are evolving at a rapid pace. How do you bring those capabilities to an older device? There's going to be always the tension between future-proofing your hardware on the one hand, but also keeping the cost and bill of materials low. Um, very eager to hear, hear how you're approaching this problem. It's a great question. and. You know, I think that there it really is going to the core of what is the purpose of the device that you're building and that you're using. And um, there's a point in time when you actually build it and put uh, software on it. And as you go through that life cycle, every new feature um, and, you know, every kind of decision that's made is really um, going back to the core of what is the purpose of that device. And, you know, we want to bring new software and capabilities to the devices that are in market. Um, but if it's going to compromise the core workloads that we're trying to achieve with that device, um, it may not be the the um, greatest idea to do that. And so it's constantly a trade-off. It's constantly um, a discussion around uh, the pros and cons of bringing the next new feature on board and how does it uh, impact whether positively or negatively um, those core workloads. So, great. Um, next question is going to be for Yun. Um, Yun, you talked uh, a great deal about the challenges you um, have faced when um, you guys worked on uh, making the large call uh, media quality better. Um, which of the challenges would you say you um, identified proved to be the most challenging and what kind of trade-off decision did you have to make as you were um, trying out different techniques? Yeah, sure. It's a good question. So I think video oscillation uh, poses one of the most challenging problems like uh, for our system. So given its association with two, uh, a lot of like modules along the path, like bandwidth estimation, bandwidth allocation, network resilience, and all the like technologies we introduced in the like uh, in the slides. And these modules were originally designed to maximize the network bandwidth usage and also the media quality at the same time. However, they can like cause our system to oscillate a lot together with the network changes during the call, uh, which could be very common like in like large group calls. Uh, in order to provide our user a stable call experience, uh, we shifted our focus uh, from like maximizing everything uh, to like providing necessary quality based on user experience and the network condition. So the changes has resulted in like very significant uh, improvement on the like video stability and the smoothness. Uh, also, some users may experience like a slight regression in video quality because we don't always like chase the highest quality now uh, and provide like stable experience. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Yun. Um, my next question is going to be for Bin. Uh, Bin, what are your timeframes for medium to long-term speech activity? Uh, that's a good question. So basically, I think it's always a trade-off between, for example, how fast you want to detect the speech and how st stable you want the result be. So uh, in our scenario, we use uh, 300 milliseconds for the medium speech activity window and three seconds for the long speech activity window. So in this case, we can detect the speech in less than 300 milliseconds, but we can also make the result very, very stable for like at least the three seconds. Thank you. All right. Um, next question is for Nitin. 
Nitin, you talked about end-to-end -end encryption. So when you say end-to-end -end encryption, which layer is the encryption uh, performed at? And is it IP layer like IPsec or TLS, DTLS, or any other layer? So there are standard protocols like uh, SRTP um, and evolving protocols like the secure frames. And this is what we use for the end-to-end -end encryption. And these protocols are specifically designed for real-time traffic. That's an advantage. Uh, there are DTLS is another standard uh, protocol that works uh, really well with real-time communication, but it's currently not used for WhatsApp calls. And we'd like to work with the industry to evolve these standards in the space. Uh, just want to reemphasize the uh, privacy and security is a significant consideration for billions of users and the calls that are flowing every day through WhatsApp. Uh, to protect from potentially curious entities like companies, governments, and even WhatsApp itself. So let's uh, involve the industry together. Okay, right, great. Thank you. Uh, Sage, next question is for you. Um, how and how often do you estimate bandwidth? Do you use separate flow? Using separate flow or bandwidth also ends up causing congestion. What are your thoughts? Uh, that's a great question. So, so bandwidth is continuously measured. Obviously, in reality, uh, we can't react to bandwidth. Uh, <clears throat> bandwidth changes uh, almost inter instantaneously. So there's some lag from when your bandwidth changes to when it's actually uh, comes in, like the effect comes into effect. Uh, but there's multiple ways to measure bandwidth. Uh, and so the algorithms use uh, things like uh, packet, packet loss, or they can measure packet delay. Uh, so we don't use separate packets to measure bandwidth. We use the existing media packets that are flowing. Uh, what we do is we get clients to ramp up their bitrate or ramp down their bitrate. Uh, uh, once they ramp it up and we start seeing congestion, we ask them to back down again. And that is how we estimate bandwidth on a continuous basis. Um, this obviously gets a lot more complicated uh, when it comes to group calls. Uh, mm -hmm. But yes, those are the mechanisms. Okay, great. Um, my next question is going to be for Sanya again. Um, Sanya, how um, does the telecommunication infrastructure, internet infrastructure advancement um, going to affect the RTC device and feature design, in your opinion? So that's, that's an interesting question. So we've seen a lot of advancements um, in that area and infrastructure. I think overall, um, you know, obviously uh, internet infrastructure has has grown and, and, you know, broadband is more widely available. And so that allows for a lot more purpose-built devices um, within areas that you actually couldn't, um, you know, uh, uh, deploy them in previously. So that's one, um, you know, uh, improvement that we're seeing. I think the second uh, piece to that is as Wi-Fi becomes more and more reliable, even for, um, you know, the purpose-built devices that we have, we're seeing more and more customers use Wi-Fi rather than, you know, a wired line um, to conduct communications. And, um, you know, that's also um, makes it a lot uh, more cost effective to to deploy in some cases. Um, it also offers a lot of flexibility to deploy um, devices uh, in places where maybe an Ethernet, um, you know, wired connection isn't available. And so um, we are seeing some of those trends, and I think those will continue. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, I'm going to go to Bin again. Um, Bin. Um, is the server-side speaker detection based on the SSRC audio level, which reduces information compared to what's available locally, or um, should the audio level be augmented a little more usefully? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, yes, it is a SSRC audio level, which was generated on the client side. So the audio level is um, aggregating the information to tell how loud or how likely the user are talking or not. So, but it without any user like speech data. So that's pretty safe. Mm -hmm. And what is never audio level information is injected in each audio packet as an RTP header and sent to the server side. So we use that audio level information to make a decision. Thank you. Um, Yun, you're up next again. Um, what algorithms do you use for bandwidth estimation for the downlinks? Similar to WebRTC Sensei BWE, uh, we use both delay-based BWE based on one-way delay and loss-based BWE based on packet loss. Um, what about the, um, the BWE before link capacity? Uh, yeah, sure. I think uh, I think as I mentioned, like we are use very similar approaches as like WebRTC and the client-side code. And we are using all the traffic we sent on the wire 
as a source of uh, as the signal of like a, uh, uh, the like bandwidth estimation signal. Like we fully depend on the like transport wide like uh, kind of uh, suck, uh, feedback, and we are using delay based BWV based on the like one V delay. And also we are uh, also we have like loss based BWV based on like the packet loss like information, uh, and also we have some like our uh, own algorithm like packet pair BWV to uh, estimate the link capacity. Uh, combining all this signal, we estimate the downlink. Yeah, thank you. And, and just a quick follow up on that: How do you like what metrics do you use to validate what you estimated is correct? Actually. So we have a set of like uh, different uh, metrics on the uh, on the like be, uh, on the congestion signal on the virus. Like uh, we measure like how many times we overuse and how many times we like resolve our congestion. And with all these like metrics, we can like understand how how good we estimate our like uh, bandwidth. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sage, my next question is going to be for you. Um, for a call that spans across multiple geographical regions, what decides which SFU is used to host a call? Do you use distributed SFUs in that case? Yeah. So the way we decide which data cluster is going to serve the call depends on uh, the expected latencies from the users in the call to those relay clusters. So what we do is we store historical latency information from every network in the world to every cluster, and then use that information to compute the relay cluster that has the most optimal latency for, for all the latencies of the users combined. And so then uh, we use that, we pick that cluster for the call. This process is called client relay election. Um, we currently don't use multiple um, uh, relay clusters to serve a single call, so it just happens to have one hop. Okay, all right, just going through. Um, I have another question for Sandhya. Do you expect any new types of communication channels to emerge in the near future other than audio and video? So, so that's an interesting question. I mean, absolutely, you know, chat is uh, something that uh, is near and dear to, I think, all of our, our hearts here. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think it's, it's really about um, the enhancements to audio and video and um, how chat may actually be integrated into that experience, um, you know, even more. Um, also, we've got, um, you know, AI, um, AI powered uh, chat um, as well with, um, you know, Copilot and, and chat GPT. So there, I think it's, it's really about how do these um, technologies converge and create kind of new and meaningful, um, deeper experiences for us to connect in real time. Um, that'll be um, pretty interesting going forward as we think through, um, you know, how we can kind of uh, bring it all together in, you know, improved, um, you know, video with multiple people and, you know, um, kind of that, uh, you know, director effect where, you know, um, it, it's more pleasing like a movie and, you know, how does chat come into that and, and audio and, and really information um, that we can get to kind of merge it all together. Okay, great. Uh, Yun, um, another question for you. How do you quantify, predict user experience in deciding uh, bandwidth allocation? Yeah, well, so there are many signals we can use. So today, we mainly depend on like a client. We will communicate with like a selective forward unit uh, proactively about like uh, the current uh, uh, screen screen layout of the user and the viewport size of each stream. Uh, after learning how each video stream is consumed, uh, the bit of way will make the like the forwarding or, uplo or uploading decision uh, for every participant. So, but in the future, definitely there are more, uh, more like signals opening. So we will discuss more signal about like uh, call size and uh, stuff to like make a better decision. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Great. Uh, ben, my next question is going to be for you. Um, can you talk a little about what type of metrics did you use to track the accuracy of the audio capping? Yeah, that's a very good question. So basically, uh, right now, uh, we the audio capping on the synaptic forwarding unit. So basically, there are two kind of information we can get to uh, tell how likely the packet is active or not. So the first one is a VAD, so which is generated on the client side. 
it will tell the voice uh, activity detection uh, to tell if this packet is a speech or not. And we also have the audio volume. So this is the audio level we talked about uh, in the previous slides to do the audio capping uh, or dominant speaker detection. So these two uh, uh, signals are very reliable and generated on the client side. So and it, it was sent to the server for each uh, audio package. With these two signals, we build a lot of uh, different metrics to tracking the audio capping precision. The precision means uh, if we drop any active packets, something like that. And we also track the latency. Latency means that, for example, how, if people start talking, how fast we can detect the speech and we can start forwarding. So generally speaking, uh, the drop of the packet should have a very low, lower volume compared with the forwarding packet. And also the drop of the packets also should have more silent packets, unless there are more than, more than four uh, active speakers. So yeah, so with these two signals, we build many uh, ki such kind of uh, metrics to measure. Uh, mm -hmm. So basically two important things. The first one is uh, precision, accuracy. The second one is the latency. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, my next question, either Saish or Nitin, I don't know who wants to answer. Um, how do you protect the um, WhatsApp servers against DDoS attacks? I don't know who wants to take it. I can take that. Okay. All right. So um, there's two levels to this uh, question. So at, at the networking level, uh, Meta has pretty sophisticated firewalls that can help protect the server against these uh, packet floods and in all of service attacks. At the application level, we do see sometimes attempted attacks, but the scale of these attacks is so small in comparison to actual scale of WhatsApp. So uh, the, our real traffic itself generates uh, like is so high that a lot of the effort that we do on a regular basis to keep up with our legitimate traffic is generally sufficient to keep uh, the service up during an attempted denial of service attacks. But if we do see an extreme event where a packet flood does kind of affect uh, our scale, we have a standard base of graceful deterioration where uh, which should uh, counter these attacks and not result in complete catastrophic failure. Okay. Uh, Sandhya, my next question is going to be for you. Um, what are your thoughts on supporting multiple VoIP apps on a single device? Do you foresee a Teams branded device running Zoom or WebEx? <laughs> That's an um, interesting question. So I guess just uh, uh, to parse that out a little bit. So, so in Microsoft Teams, we don't actually make hardware. Uh, we work with a number of um, partners and we have a robust partner ecosystem that supplies hardware on which uh, the Teams application uh, will run. Um, in terms of offering multiple apps, you know, that's um, again, going back to the core of uh, what we think about when we, de when we develop, um, you know, purpose-built devices, it is to fulfill a certain workload. And, and that is for, um, you know, customers and teams to, um, you know, um, fulfill, um, you know, various um, activities, whether that's, you know, calling or um, getting into their team's um, meetings. And um, so we don't really foresee multiple apps running on uh, one device, um, you know, PCs and, and mobile phones, um, you know, do have those capabilities. Um, we do see often, um, you know, sometimes you might have an external meeting that might be on another platform. And so for those one-off cases, uh, we do offer solutions that um, offer sort of a web-based uh, way to connect, um, but that's really kind of um, a smaller use case. It doesn't require kind of a full-fledged app on the device, um, which you know will obviously have a lot of impact to performance and, and whatnot. So overall, no, uh, not really planning on um, you know app switching. And I think the way that um, sort of you, you asked the question, but. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Yoon, uh, I have another question for you. Uh, do all clients have multiple video layers with different bit rates they can switch to? Does any client do real-time target bit rate change in the encoder? Would the latter still work? Uh, yeah, definitely. So we, we do have the backward compatibility here. So today we have like rolled out the simulcast capability to all like major devices, including like mobile, large screen stuff. 
Uh, however, in certain cases, like when the user don't have like very good uplink network, uh, we could possibly still like only offer one layer. So we still have the capability to adjust the bitrate through like REMB dynamically uh, to fit the like a different kind of downlink usage here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Bin, I have another question for you next. Uh, so it sounds like current dominant speaker algorithm is centralized. Um, is there, or what's the plan to build a truly distributed dominant speaker detection algorithm? Uh, thank you for the question. I think this is a very uh, good question. So if we look at the detailed algorithm described as slice, so you can see that the uh, centralized computing is only needed for the ranking because for the other mm -hmm. kind of workflow, for example, tracking each uh, user's uh, uh, background lowest level, like calculate the speech activity score, everything can be happened locally. Locally, I mean, can be happened on the pipeline which connected to the end user. So uh, with that uh, assumption, so I think we can uh, introduce a local plus global decision making model. So basically, uh, uh, we will do a lot of working on the local side for example, just as I mentioned, like uh, uh, tracking the audio level, detect the lowest floor, calculate the speciality score. And then we make a local decision if we see a significant uh, score jump. That normally means uh, users are talking, right? So but at that time, we don't get a global decision, uh, refreshed global decision. So we will do the local decision first. And then we will push the local score to a shared load. The shared load is a larger, uh, uh, centralized, but it, the the centralized component is very lightweight because it only do the ranking. So that's a pretty uh, straightforward uh, logic there. Then the the centralized uh, 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 ranking uh, component, we are just do a very like uh, quick ranking and then response the current score after it got what the late uh, what the latest uh, score from what the participant. So and the 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 corresponding uh. A pipeline after got the, the, the ranking response from the, the global component, then it will do a, a, a another kind of uh, a, a local deci local decision plus the global decision, and then we will start doing the doing the forwarding or, or law forwarding. So in this model, we still have a have a centralized component, but that centralized component is a very lightweight uh, a component, and which is only used for the ranking. So the ranking can be very, uh, you know, very fast and not sh shouldn't cause any like scaling problem. Yeah. So I think current WhatsApp is trying to use this model. Uh, it works pretty good. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, Sage, my next question is for you again. Um, how is the pop region um, for the relay server determined where participants are in different geographic locations? Also, are artificial delays added to sync the media? Right. So I covered part of this in the previous question, but I'd like to answer this specifically for this, uh, like when participants are very far apart. So we, like, like I said before, like uh, we use uh, expected latencies from each user to the pop, re uh, pop uh, the region uh, relay cluster to select the right relay cluster for the call. Um, but there are a lot more things we can do when uh, the people are very far apart. This is because when people are far apart, um, the latency is much higher, and it's not. And so, late, higher latency can affect the call in ways in ways that are not normal. Like for example. Packet loss is much worse. Uh, it has much worse effect on the call in case of uh, higher latencies because the transcriptions take that much longer. Uh, so we do some creative routing. We try and route as much of the traffic over our uh, dedicated backbone links, uh, and we're trying constantly improving our routing systems to try and improve that and route more of our calls over the backbone. So that's some things that we do. Um, uh, uh, the other things, uh, the, the other question I think was about artificial delays, right? Uh, so on the server side, at least there's no artificial delay added and syncing is really not like the server's responsibility because anyway, like all the content is end-to-end -end encrypted and there's nothing the server can do. The only delay I'm aware of that happens is because of the jitter buffer on the client side and that's more to reduce jitter, uh, jitter than to uh, increase sync. Okay. Um, a quick follow-up on that. So for a audio or a video call, is there only one pop involved or there could be multiple pops? There is just one pop involved. Yeah. Um, 
And that's the, uh, by the way, how the remote presence part of it uh, differs. In our case, you could have multiple um, pops involved. Um, all right, I have another question for Yun. Um, how are the codecs and their parameters determined for group calls? Does the SFE transcode stream uh, stream selectively? Uh, so I think we have already discussed uh, like in audio session. So we are doing end-to-end -end encryption. So it's just a uh, selective foreign unit. It's not an MCU. So we don't do any like transcoding on the server side. And for the codec stuff, it's still like decided based on each client's capabilities through like SDP negotiation. And the server side definitely will do a kind of a global negotiation to see which codec is supported on each client and we definitely have a priority like at least about maybe uh, uh AV1 is like higher than 264 for example and the uh, uh, specific like encoding parameter is still decided on the client side based on some encoding factor like uh, resolution frame rate and also some like a scalar decision yeah okay all right i have um i believe this is going to be the final question um, are you using or thinking of using Quick for transport? And before um, either you or Saish can take it, but I'll just preface this um, by saying Quick is um, heavily utilized in um, various meta use cases, um, not just uh, entirely for the real time um, flow. But um, you or Saish, do you guys want to take it? You can go first, maybe. Okay, I can go first. So, okay. um, we have been discussing use of Quick uh, uh, for uh, calling, and I think Quick fits the use case very well. Uh, uh, I think Quick is works much better with firewalls and has a lot of capabilities, like it provides some basic level of encryption and authentication and things like that. Uh, so we have been discussing it. We'd love for Quick to become more standard for use with uh, real-time protocols. Uh, so far, we're not using it, but there have been discussions around it. Yes, we do use it, however, like within the meta infrastructure for um, mm -hmm. transporting the media packets, and that's working out pretty well. But yes, uh, it is um, very often a uh, revisited topic uh, among both WhatsApp and our teams. So uh, we're all excited about potential improvements there. Okay, I don't see any other questions coming in. Um, I wanted to thank all our um, uh, speakers for answering these questions, and thank you, uh, to our audience for submitting so many interesting and, and engaging questions. Um, if you still come up with any other questions, please uh, continue posting them. We'll uh, find a way to get the answers back to you. Uh, we're now gonna go into lunch break, I believe. So enjoy your lunch and we'll see you soon. Thanks you everyone.